the Kubernetes is Kubernetes uh, on-prem, why is it hard? And so we'll, we'll dive in and we'll try and make up some time. Uh, I hate this meme, but it's perfect for this situation, nonetheless. Um, if you are doing on-prem operations, this is probably how you feel when somebody's like, oh, I did it in the cloud and it rolled out and it was super easy. That is really what this talk is about. Um, my background, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, I'm at Zeekle on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter and love to have wars, debates, and discussions. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called RackN. We specialize in data center operations, uh, but we do it from the bare metal side up. So we focus on the real nitty gritty side of the operational problem. Um, to do that, we have an open source project called Digital Rebar that's really rethinking what boot provision and operations and workflows and things like that should be. Um, and I co-host a podcast called The Latest Shiny, that's L8IST-SH9Y, where we talk about edge and DevOps and open source and all sorts of great stuff. Um, please check it out, and if you are interested in being on the show and have something interesting to say, let me know. We'll, we'd love to talk to people. We especially like to do what we call a rant cast which is where there's something that just pisses the crap out of you and you have to get it off your chest. And, and so we'll, we'll spend five minutes letting you rant about it and then we'll spend 20 minutes saying why it's actually not, it's what causes that to happen. <laughs> we had, we did one. Uh, we did one about like the phrase private cloud. We have some great shows. Um, we have a good one coming out, but you can go listen to it. So why is Kubernetes so hard? Um, it's, it really has a very simple architecture. Uh, it's as easy as a database, things connect directly to the database, as an API server, that's good. Um, and if you think about OpenStack, OpenStack is hold my beer on the architectural <laughs> diagram. So Kubernetes is, if you're thinking Kubernetes, it's really just not that big a deal. So it's, it's not hard as an architectural and application. Everybody here I'm sure is supporting applications that are much more complex than Kubernetes is. But it's, it's just the fact that you're running a system that makes things complex, right? Kubernetes architecture isn't complex, but there's a whole bunch of things that don't even show up on those architectural charts that make things really complex, like having a load balancer in front of your ABI server, worrying about your, your authentication and controls, multi-node clustering, provisioning, overlay networking, all that stuff. That's really hard. And if you do that in the cloud, the cloud has services that provide all of that functionality. And so when you run a Kubernetes on AWS installer or use the services that they're providing, they're just hooking into all these services behind the scenes that you're not even worried about. And, and that makes a huge difference. Most companies on premises deployments don't have automation around a lot of these services, right? Or if they do, they're certainly not the ones that everybody else has. So when you pull down an Ansible playbook and try and plug it in, all of a sudden you have to worry about all these pieces. And so the reality is operations is hard. On-premises operations is hard, harder, because you don't have these things, right? Every one of these, you're gonna have to figure out on your own or figure out how to map it into your infrastructure. And so the routine instructions that you pull down for Kubernetes have to be mapped and fixed. And one of the things that uh, Kubernetes does is a lot of these pieces are actually required. And we'll get into that uh, quite a bit. So when you think about this, Kubernetes isn't hard. Operations is hard, that's why we're here, thankless as it is. And operations on premises is very hard. And I don't wanna sugarcoat that, right? The thing that we learned uh, when we do boot provision is that boot provisioning is actually pretty easy. Net booting is not that hard. But making it work inside of somebody's operational environment and connecting to all of their services is much harder. That's why we end up with a lot of manual steps. So I'm gonna break down Kubernetes into these pieces and talk about them a little bit and give you some real options about how, what, what you can do with this. Um, so that as you approach a Kubernetes deployment, you can think through how you need to solve these problems. Or if you're trying to do these in a multi-cloud way, how you can solve these problems. Or if you're doing Kubernetes in the cloud, just be glad that you don't have to solve these problems. You can just sort of say, ah, it's good. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll get to the end as I get to the end. Um, so if you're building Kubernetes, you really need a load balancer. Um, 
it is the first requirement that you're going to show up with in any infrastructure for the API server. It needs to be load balanced. But even the applications that are coming in, while Kubernetes can distribute the load, you really have one ingress point, and you need a load balancer to distribute those ingress points. It is a requirement. It's one of the reasons on-premises Kubernetes just falls on its face for the most part, because until the Metal, the M Metal LB came around, there really wasn't even a good way to get uh, a load balancer integrated into Kubernetes. And the challenge here is that it's not just that you need a load balancer, it's you need a, dyna a dynamic load balancer. Because as your cluster changes and grows and spins up, it's going to require you to have a lot more information about how the system's working. It's not like I have a web server farm and it's just sitting statically um, to make it work. Now, it, it, Kubernetes does help you with ingress. And so if you're, you're, you can make a call against an API, uh, a, a cluster or a pod in the system, and it'll figure out where to send the traffic. Um, and that'll work, but it's not a production deployment. Okay, And so you have to think about that. Um, there's a, a new class of things. I should have said service mesh instead of Istio specifically. But uh, service mesh is this concept of being able to manage inbound traffic and then do a whole bunch of work to understand your application and control your application about it. And it, service mesh is a fancy word for load balancer, right? It's, it's really a rever it's reverse proxy components too, but you're, you're really just controlling your ingress traffic. And that's what Istio and service meshes are about. So it's just a little bit more complex. Um, so all those are good. And then if you're going to deal with an external load balancer, you probably already have some in, uh, in your, if you're doing on-premises work, then you have to think about how that's going to interface into your Kubernetes cluster, and you have to manage it from that perspective. Uh, networking. Um, yeah, all these are really about networking. But there's, there's more than networking um, that you have to think about. Because Kubernetes makes a lot of assumptions about how networking works, about how it can access uh, information between the, the clusters. I'd have to go back to the uh, picture. But one of the, the consequences of Kubernetes having a very simple architecture and using Docker, or ContainerD now, I guess we should say, under the covers is that you really have very few networking choices and options. So if you show up in a on-premise install and your team or you are saying, hey, I really should use the second NIC because it's, it's teamed and bonded, and I want to segregate my traffic from my application, that's not default out-of-the-box behavior. Two NICs in a container is not easy right, or even possible. And even the idea that my Docker infrastructure is going to route on a different NIC than my administrative networks, than my storage networks, you're going to have to think all those things through. And if you're segmenting your traffic like a lot of us do on premises, then your storage traffic coming out of that container is not going to naturally flow to another network. You have to think those things through. So it's, it's tricky. Um, and you have to be prepared to fight with Docker taking over your networking. This is one of the places where VMs are really advantaged because I can take a virtual machine and put it on the right network or I can put multiple NICs in a virtual machine. And so a lot of times what we see, so I mean, we're big advocates of Kubernetes on metal because we like metal, but the reality is, is that if you have to do networking segmentation or you have to put things on specific networking, you're going to need to put your, your containers in a virtual machine to get them on the right network get them to segment it or isolate it in the right network, just because that's the, the challenge right now with how we are. I think this will get better, but that's the way we are. Um, and so use those virtual machines. Th there are some really good uh, software-defined networking, SDN technologies behind the scenes with, with Kubernetes. You're going to be using them, period, like Calico. Um, uh, but you might find that it's worth paying for a layer, you know, like, for example, paying Tigera for the additional ex extensions that they put behind Calico, because it's really actually a very sophisticated um, system, and having insight and visibility is going to help you. Uh, if you don't know what FFS is, go Google that. Um, it is the theme for this. This is actually the, the theme for the talk is FFS, use Kubernetes the right way. So if you need net, you know, networking that's really complex, Kubernetes might not, or containers in general, might not be the right thing for you to be using on your application. Uh, boy, pace of change. Kubernetes does quarterly releases, right? You should be prepared to take them. They have bug fixes and patches and security fixes and things like that. 
do not assume you're going to take this, this release and then run it for, for years. You should plan to be doing a continuous deployment of that platform infrastructure. Um, and when I, when I talk about pace of change, it's not just, and everybody should know this, right? This isn't just about the thing you're deploying, it's about the dependency graph under the thing you're deploying. So your operating system, the patches, Docker itself, the networking pieces, they all have their own uh, release cycles. So it's not just that Kubernetes is every quarter, it's all of the pieces around it have their own release cycles and their own versioning and things like that. And you, you better be prepared to respond when Docker comes out with a new version and changes its, 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 its infrastructure and its APIs. It's, they've gotten a lot better than they used to be, but this is a really real problem. Um, and one of the things that I hear very commonly in, um, in field is that people have multiple clusters, right? Back to the small versus large cluster sizes. Most people have small clusters and they have version drift among their clusters, right? Because you can't just willy-nilly upgrade somebody's cluster once they've depended on it to be operating. You might have an SLA, you might have an API version, there might be some drift that somebody needs or some new feature that somebody needs. So you better prepare to have multiple clusters running at different versions. It's just the reality of it. And there's a, there's a couple of companies that are doing cluster management, multi-cluster management, and helping with this story. But what I've seen is that we get a proliferation of s a lot of small Kubernetes clusters. And if that doesn't make you nervous from a management perspective, then you, you, you've got some magic that I don't have. Um, but it's gonna be the reality of, of, how, of how things are run. Um, and that means when you look at Kubernetes, plan for day two upgrades. Right? Don't, don't put in the cluster manually and expect you're gonna be happy and don't do it with automation that doesn't have an upgrade path. It's really, really important, especially a rolling upgrade path. Um, I'm a huge fan of immutable, uh, immutable infrastructure, immutable deployments, which means baking your whole system together all the way. And so that it becomes a really important piece of, of how you should think through your infrastructure and what's going on. Um, I have whole talks about immutable deployments. If you Google me, you'll find our immutable deployment. So if, that, if you're like, I've never heard that term, I have an hour-long talk about that. Um, it's really important from a DevOps perspective. Um, and then this is one of the things that's useful. While I'm, I'm, rally, I'm ranting against having a lot of clusters, if you have smaller clusters, you have a smaller blast radius. And so, especially if you're new for Kubernetes, start small. Don't put two, two teams in the same cluster and hope that they're gonna get along. Keep the blast ra radius small and have a strategy for how you're gonna converge into larger clusters or manage those clusters. Yay, TLS. Uh, so one of the things that I, I really uh, admired about Kubernetes from day one is that they required you to use uh, secure uh, communication between the protocol points. So all of the communications in Kubernetes are secured, HTTPS secured. Um, I'm, I was in OpenStack for a long time. That was not a default setting in OpenStack. And I'm glad it is in Kubernetes. It should be your default. If you are enabling HTTPS on anything, go fix that today, right now, go. Um, but the consequence is that means you actually have to do TLS management you need to have a plan to rotate your TLS certificates, which is not something that Kubernetes handled out of the box right away. Um, and so it's important for you to understand you, you need to actually think through how you're gonna manage the certificates that drive these interfaces. And there's multiple interfaces, so you could literally have multiple private T uh, TLS domains between different components of your interface. So you could segment traffic between your API server and your storage server and your um, coordination server and your gateways and, and that's a good idea to do it, it's just a lot harder. And then you have to be prepared to rotate them. Um, and so when you look at how you're gonna build this, think about you know, what you're doing from that infrastructure. So you need to name things if you're gonna use standard certs. If you're gonna use wildcard certs and IP addresses, that's great, but you're gonna have to be able to propagate that those certs are, uh, are okay across your domain. It's tricky. Just is. It's one of the things that, that when we build our automation, we actually build that cert management in. Hopefully your company has some type of cert management software and you can, and you can take advantage of it, but that means you're gonna need DNS. 
One of the things we were joking, we, one of the questions at trivia is what, what's always at fault in any problem, right? It's DNS. Uh, DNS is surprisingly hard to get right and maintained and, and, and do that. Um, but they, systems expect names. So if you're going to be working in a Kubernetes infrastructure on premises, expect that you're going to have to get your DNS infrastructure up to speed. And you're going to want to do it with APIs and automatically. One of the things that people don't, don't think about much with cloud is every machine in the cloud, they give it a friggin' name automatically for you, and you can refer to it by that name. It's by multiple names, public and private names. That makes a huge difference. So when you build an infrastructure in uh, on-premises, you need to have ways that when you, give, you, you build machines, you give them names. VMs are physical, it doesn't matter. Um, and think about IPv6. Now, K Kubernetes and IPv6 are not particularly friendly right now. That doesn't mean it's not important in your infrastructure. Um, one of the things that Kubernetes has done in recent releases is they fully integrated DNS into the infrastructure, and so look at that um, and consider using the open DNS capabilities that are built into the system. Um, but you need to be able to do that, and if you can, you might have a, your own domain for the Kubernetes cluster to make the naming less, more isolated. I know in corporate environments, getting names set in DNS can be really tricky, and so that's important to think about. Wow. Uh, this is the weakest area in Kubernetes, in my opinion. Um, there are a ton of concerns about getting storage right in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and one of the, the simple answer, um, <laughs> the simple answers here is to not run applications that require storage. Uh, so Kubernetes is a really good good fit for a stateless web server or a stateless application and that you want to scale up and scale down, rock on, use it like crazy. If you're not doing that, then you're going to have to figure out storage concerns, um, which means either you're going to have to be storing things locally on ephemeral, on the ephemeral machines themselves, counting on Docker storage mechanisms or attaching to storage and exposing the storage in, into your containers and mapping the drives and things like that. That's messy. Um, one of the things I do know is that if you have servers that are running, these are Docker hosts, Docker can use up a lot of storage really quickly without you even realizing that it's happening. And so be careful if you're counting on ephemeral storage that you're leaving enough ephemeral storage or that you're purging it, right? Because what happens is, let, let me be very specific on this because I'm talking fast and I have enough time to be explicit. If I'm running a, a big stable on-premises cluster with a certain amount of storage allocated and I am in a nice CI pipeline, so I'm sending down new images all the time and I've got new containers coming, and especially if you're not very good about creating uh, layers in your Docker container for reuse, you could literally be sending 10 or 15 new Docker images to each server on a daily basis. And those are gonna accumulate very silently in your Docker, local Docker repos and chew up all your disk space. So if you have a big application, like some nice Java thing doing some really good solid Java work for you and you're sending a whole bunch of data in there that are uh, storage in there, you're gonna run out of your, your storage infrastructure really fast. Um, one of the solutions for that is to rotate your machines and put yourself in a normal uh, machine rotation and rebuild them all the time, constantly expand and contract your cluster just allow good right rotation hygiene. Highly recommend that no matter what. Um, but be prepared if you're not rotating your machines, you're gonna chew up space and it's gonna be a very silent uh, type of thing. Um, remote storage, there are some, some great technologies coming into Kubernetes to allow you to attach remote storage to containers called stateful sets um, that allow you to say, oh, I wanna attach storage into a container. Great, it's uh, useful to use it. Make sure you understand why you're using it. Um, but if you're doing it on premises, that means you have to understand how you're attaching and deal with your storage infrastructure. And then you have to remember that storage is networking in that case. And so you have to build your networking infrastructure in a way that either isolates storage traffic or doesn't get bogged down if you're trying to do a lot of storage operations. So it's, it's a balance. It's, it's my recommendation with Kubernetes and storage is expect not to be happy and anything you do is gonna be a short-term solution. 
So you, you want it, you're going to need something, right? Applications require storage, unless you take my first recommendation of stateless. And when you build your application, expect that you're going to have to come back and revisit it, and things are going to improve, and the, uh, the platform is going to improve. Uh, operating systems, so, boy, <laughs> this goes so deep. Um, and this is in my subject area, so I'm going to try and give something help helpful. Um, Docker and ContainerD are, are relatively new compared to Linux and, and the operating systems in general. Um, and so expect that you will need to be using current operating systems, right? The latest kernels, um, drivers, right? You do not, do not try and go back on your 10-year-old Red Hat support contract and expect them to support containers. Um, and even more, I would expect to continue needing to stay on the latest operating systems. That doesn't mean you need to be using Ubuntu 1904, um, but it does mean that, that you need to have a plan where if you're using a corporate image, that corporate image has to be updated, has to be a current, a current image, right? You can't be doing um, the, what, 16, I still see people on 1604, 1610, 1604 is the, old, old stable. Um, and it, because you're going to end up patching the kernel anyway, so don't, don't do that. Um, one of the things that's interesting with containers is they don't have the isolation that VMs do. And so when you're using a virtual machine, you're getting a virtual kernel, you're getting virtual network drivers, you're getting virtual everything. The, the, in containers, you don't have that luxury. And so depending on what you're building, it, it can actually matter how you've built the machine, how you've maintained it, how you've patched it. Um, that can be great because you've eliminated uh, a, a stack of drivers, but it can also be problematic. So, it, you know, be prepared to, to if you're, especially if you're trying Kubernetes on metal, that you actually need a story about the full system. You've been able to ignore it in virtual machines, and, and that's not, that's not going to help you. Um, and stuffing, uh, but just saying, hey, I don't care about that. I'm just going to put things in VMs. Um, it might not be enough to actually achieve what you're hoping to achieve. Um, you still have to deal with the operating systems and, and, and how things are going. And, and so the short answer becomes, of course, automate, automate, automate. But when you think about what we're doing with Kubernetes, plan to be doing a lot more reprovisioning of the systems. One of the nice things about Kubernetes that you want to take advantage of is that it deals with failures. And so you can shut down machines and rotate them through your cluster. That's a good practice. Um, and you should be doing that on a regular basis. But so plan those things in. Don't just plan your Kubernetes cluster to be a big stable platform that you're just going to leave up and running. You want to, be for all the reasons we've been naming, you want to continue to automate them. Immutable, once again, does help you if you can build a stable image and, and then roll that out. Um, there's a couple of platforms out there uh, that I'm seeing that are starting to do um, you know, some more machine automation. There's something uh, emerging in Kubernetes called cluster lifecycle work, um, where they're actually building cluster level APIs that assume you can cartridge machines in and out of it, so you can scale up and scale down the physical layer at the cluster, physical, virtual, physical, the machine layer, and roll things in and out. Um, it's still pretty early, but watch that. If you're managing a cluster, do not assume it's a static cluster. Assume that you're going to be constantly rolling machines in an upgrade pattern through the system, right? That's a really good pattern. Um, we could do a whole talk about just that. And then consult your distro requirements, right? How am I doing? What? <laughs> All right. Um, wow. Really? So distros have tentacles. Um, you're going to want support for this, but be careful um, with your if you're buying a distro and going in from a distro perspective. Um, if you do opt for a distro, expect to pay for it and that you're going to require consulting. All the companies I know doing distros are also requiring you to do it their way. Um, and Trunk has challenges with it. Uh, so the question becomes, what are we going to do? Uh, my takeaways here, uh, it's not an island. You have to integrate to it. Um, 
when you look at building your cluster, you know, uh, fix your, fix your root, root causes. Get the cluster working, but then make sure you're doing good operations work around it, especially around day two. Um, my FFS comment, always, right? Don't expect Kubernetes to solve problems that it's not meant to solve right now. It's growing in maturity, but it's not a hammer for every, for every problem. Um, I'd invite you to look at the stuff that we're doing. We actually have a really pretty little Kubernetes installer that, that sort of self-building cluster type stuff. Even if you don't need what we're doing, the patterns are mimic good patterns that we've been talking about here. Wow. So I'm Rob Hirschfeld, uh, happy to talk question, take, if do we have time for questions? All right, excellent. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Awesome, do we have any questions? Anybody? Looking, looking? Right in the back. I'll leave this up for people to read. So you mentioned it's good practice, good maintenance to be rotating your worker nodes or your or your data nodes. Um, short of roll your own, is there any good tooling or good way to do that? Um, you can I, look at the pattern that we've built. Um, that's one way to do it. It, it really comes back to, if, if you use an immutable image and some scripting to join the cluster, which is not that hard to do, it's, it's, it's pretty good, but I, and cluster API is making some real progress. So I would, I would if, if you watch cluster API and machine controller from that perspective, and you will, you'll, you'll actually be pretty surprised they're doing a good job. I'm not one to say people are doing a good job if I don't think they are, and that they're legitimately doing the right stuff. Any other questions? Istio does not require Metal LB. Um, so, so Istio is going to watch the the infrastructure. It's going to get wired into where the containers are, and it's going to be able to r do some traffic routing. That's where the reverse the reverse proxy pieces come in. That's a good question. Um, believe that's right. I'd, I'd have to look through how Istio Ingress is handled. I wouldn't, I haven't seen anybody do Istio on premises yet, so I'm not tracking it a, a, as much. We're doing on prem, we're going to be doing Istio, we're currently working with Metal LB, so does Istio handle it as a... I don't think, I don't think you're going to, I think you're still going to require Metal LB with, with the Istio pieces. It's a really, it's a good question. Um, and I know for the stuff that we've been doing, we have both pieces in place, but I don't know if anybody's integrated it yet. It's a community component, yeah. Just to follow up, are you just throwing HA proxy or just whatever your favorite load balancer is in front of the Kubernetes APIs? Yeah, I mean, that's a, you can certainly do that. You need to have something. Um, the problem with HA proxy is it's just not, doesn't have all the, a, the APIs that people typically want, and so you're gonna you're gonna need to figure out how you're gonna integrate those things together. Yeah. And a good load balancer is yeah it's an expensive proposition for for reasons. Um, but yeah, so Metal LB is the one I would look at. Uh, the problem is, is that everything in, a, in Kubernetes really expects you to have API control because it's really a cloud platform. And so this is sort of the, the, the other part of the theme, right, is that everything expects to have an API. And so if you don't, if you have static stuff in your infrastructure, you're going to really struggle um, because Kubernetes assumes you're in Amazon or Google, Microsoft, and they have APIs for everything. And so they just call out to stuff. This is the secret, right, of Kubernetes on Amazon, on, on these cloud platforms, is they just had, they literally hard-coded uh, DNS and load balancer integrations into the clouds, uh, assuming a, the APIs for the clouds. It was literally coded into the executables. And so when you used to run it, before they separated those out, you used to run Kubernetes and on-premises and it just didn't work because it didn't, it couldn't call out to the APIs that it needed. 
you guys do, sorry, um, a lot of on-prem work with existing data centers, I assume, I assume you do. How do you deal with the people that have a bunch of tools that like have no APIs or they have no idea how to integrate with them? Or I mean, because that's been my life for the last five <laughs> years is going in and trying to figure out how do you provision a VM? No, you can't touch this button. It has to be automated. Stop touching buttons. Um, we spend a lot of time being able to wrap things. Like, like so for us, this is a sort of a rack and statement, but it's it's really useful for what do you do? That I would call that brownfield. Um, but but so our our big aha when when you know even before we started the company was that every data center is a brownfield, right? Even if you roll in new servers with a completely greenfield thing, if you're going into a data center, it's a brownfield environment because you have naming conventions and IP addresses and you have things that, that buttons you can't touch and stuff like that or network topologies that you can't, can't change. Um, and so what we do is we spend a lot of time um, building, building integrat integratable tooling that can wrap those functions. And we typically, as a philosophy, try not to break people's operational tooling um, as much as we possibly can. But that's, that's a philosophy thing. Um, so what I would suggest, you know, sometimes you just wrap those things in APIs and, and or find tools that are going to respect the boundaries on it. Um, it's, that's a really hard problem. Sometimes you rip them out and you find a replacement. Um, but you, have to, you do it judiciously. This is one of the places where Kubernetes is like, yeah, I'm going to put in Kubernetes. And then you hit that one place where it's like, but I don't have a way to allocate um, an IP address or a name server except by, by filing a ticket. And that's, that's why the talk here is why a lot of people just run, into, run, in, run aground in these deployments because they didn't realize how integrated the deployment was. Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a short war story. Um, we're dealing with a, a, a big company, and every time they provision a machine, it, they have to register it in Active Directory so people can log into it, which makes perfect sense. But the Active Directory process takes about 20 minutes to propagate. And so they wanted to reduce their provisioning time to less than 20 minutes, and so you had to do operations out of band. So when the machine comes up, we'll discover it. We'll t say, hey, Active Directory, here's the new machine. Here's all the credential and information you need. And then we'll go install an operating system on it and, and get to a point and then check back and see if the credentials are ready. Um, and, and so that's the type of, of th thought process where you're like, all right, I got to work within the environment that I have. Um, and that's just what data centers are. That's why they're hard. So. You're welcome. Hey, uh, are all these problems native to Kubernetes, or if we pick another uh, platform like HashiCorp Nomad, mm. the same thing follows them also? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, they are endemic in any platform that you deploy on premises. This is why the OpenStack stuff, right? OpenStack has this reputation of being just impossible to install, and it's not, but, be, but you have to deal with a lot more prereqs even than you do with Kubernetes. So it's not, it's not specific to Kubernetes, but it does require some things like Nomad doesn't have, I don't think it has the TLS requirements. No. So you don't, you don't, you're not forced to figure out TLS right. and build certificates in order to build the cluster. Um, and so there, there's, you're gonna get pros and cons on all those things. Nomad's, Nomad's architecture doesn't scale as, as big. Um, but if you, if you only needed a, you know, a 10, up to 10 or 20 maybe machine cluster, Nomad's very usable for that. So is there any platform that specifically was created for on-prem or bare metal, like container management platform? Not is that even possible? Like, is it's, totally, it's totally possible. Uh, I mean, Kubernetes is, a, is actually a really good model for a lot of the on-premises pieces. Right. The, the, the bigger issue is just that most there's no consistent uh, platform for it. <laughs> On-prem is really hard. It's, it's, uh, and it's, you know, this is where, go ahead. Ra but, but, well, but wait, Ranch Rancher, especially if you're going to use Rancher OS, does not handle UEFI booting very well. And so, uh, you know, in VMs, it's great. Use Ran Rancher, Rancher actually has a lot of these things built into it. That's a good point. Um, and it's, it's a good, it's a good platform to streamline things. I mean, it really is Kubernetes, so they're just helping lift some things, and there are vendors who will help lift it. Um, but...
Hey guys, let's move this to an open space. We've got lunch by signal effects. So get your lunch, let's make this an open space. All right guys?